Uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the Georges River Local Planning Panel meeting for the 15th of August 2019. Um, we are the panel who have been appointed by the Minister for Planning and by the Council to determine specific um, development applications, uh, including development applications that are on the agenda today in accordance with the requirements of the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act. My name is Paul Vergottis. Uh, I'm the chairperson for today's panel. And the other members with me today are Mr. Michael Levy, uh, expert member to my left, to my far left, uh, the community representative, Mr. Cameron Jones, and to my right, Mr. John Brockoff, who's also an uh, expert uh, member of the panel. I'm required to advise you that under the provisions of the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act, uh, this meeting of the panel is being live streamed and will be made available on the Council's website. Everyone must uh, ensure that they speak into the microphone clearly when you submit your uh, matters to the panel. So when speaking, um, members of the public should ensure their speeches are respectful and appropriate. A person who uses defamatory, discriminatory or offensive language may be exposed to liability to which the council or, uh, and this panel take no responsibility for. Any part of this meeting that's held in a closed session will not be recorded. The panel have received a uh, completed um, assessment development application uh, reports from the council staff for all six development applications before us. The panel have undertaken inspections of the sites um, today and nearby locality uh, properties for all the six matters that are on the agenda. We'll deal with the uh, six applications in the order of, that they're listed on the agenda, which is number four, the Esplanade South Hurstville, number 11, Arnold Street, Peakhurst, seven to 11, Short Street, South Hurstville, one to seven, Bowens Road, Cogra, 6 to 8 Warren Street, Blakehurst, and then 105 Victoria Avenue and 2A Cook Street, Mortdale. As required by the Local Planning Panel uh, Code of Conduct, <coughs> the panel members are required to disclose any conflicts of interest with respect to any matter on the, today's agenda. The relevant forms prescribed by the Department of Planning have been completed and are tabled for the Council uh, to include um, uh, on the online minutes of the meeting. They're also available for scrutiny if anyone wants to look at them. They're right here. Uh, no panel uh, member today has disclosed any conflict of interest in any, mat any of the matters on today's agenda. As we progress uh, through the matters on the agenda, only those persons who've been registered with the council prior uh, to this meeting will be permitted to address the panel. Each uh, person will be provided three minutes to address the panel. But if you need a little bit longer time and you're on point, we can give you extra time to make your points understood or um, so you can raise uh, all the matters that you want to. Um, I have, as the chair, discretion to allow you extra time. Uh, in each item, we'll hear from the objectors first and then from the applicant. I would ask those persons who are seeking to address the panel to come forward and sit in front and talk clearly into the microphone. Uh, once the panel have heard all the various speakers who have registered to speak for particular applications, we are then able to move on to the next application. Members of the public are free to leave after their item of interest has been concluded. Once we've heard from all of uh, the speakers who have registered to uh, make submissions about each application, we'll then adjourn the meeting and deliberate on each matter and make a decision. Our decisions will be um, in the closed session and then published on the Council's website tomorrow. So we'll now call for the first item, which is the development application for the childcare facility at number four, the Esplanade South Hurstville. Um, I have registered to speak against the proposal. Um, two people, Janelle Carew. Ms Carew, are you here? Please come forward, ma'am. Please take a seat. Laws all yours. Okay, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I'm the registered owner of an adjacent property, being the Middle Villa, number two at 60 Esplanade. I was fortunate enough to inherit the property on the passing of my parents, who bought the villa immediately after construction. I intend to only speak with respect to my property and not those of my neighbours, although I do believe they share some of my. Um, I don't know what to call it. It's too emotional. Um, I'm, and I thank you all for coming to view my backyard this afternoon. Um, as you would have heard me this afternoon, I'm deeply disappointed in the size of this proposal of a childcare centre. It's too big for our area. It's not too big for the property, and I fully understand that. Um, but as to our area 
and the, the need for another childcare centre, it's too big for 68 children. We don't need a 68 child placement. I currently have a small view, which you would have seen this afternoon, and I enjoy that small view as it is, and it will be grossly interrupted by the construction of this new building, which is going to be double the size of the construction that's currently there. As is one of the, the plans that was put in, there's a, a shadow. And as you would have seen this afternoon um, at 2.30 when you were there, come winter, the description of the shadow in the um, DA is grossly wrong. I lose everything before three o'clock, well and truly. And the only part of my property that'll have any sun will be the roof. So I lose heating, I lose line washing the lot. On reviewing those, the shadow specifications, I was appalled to see that I would no longer enjoy any sunlight on my property. It's going to force me to use more electricity. The, the strata has always been opposed to getting solar because we're not meant to show anything external on our roofs um, to the street. It's maybe something that we're going to have to reconsider, which is going to be an enormous expense to me, something that I can't afford. I object to the content moving on to the traffic. Um, you would have seen there was um, cars parked in the street today. It's only going to be worse. Our street is not as wide as the DA says it is. It, the DA says that two cars can pass comfortably in our street. On any given day, on, at any given time, there are par cars parked on both sides, if not just one side. It does not allow for two cars to pass. The, the garbage truck barely passes through our street of a morning on a Wednesday morning. It also notes that um, there's no street signage. I agree, there's no 50 kilometres street signage. Most people know that suburban streets are 50 kilometres, but I can tell you that I've had to stand well and truly away from my car door when there are several cars going up the street because they don't do 50 kilometres. They do well and more than 50 kilometres. And that's a concern when you're looking at small children. The report, the DA is saying that there is going to be 17 car spaces now. There were 18, but one has been removed. I really can't see parents using that car space or car park facility. People these days are too tight time poor. It's going to be too much trouble for them to use a car park to go down and then come up with their child. Um, so again, our street is going to be become dysfunctional with the, um, the amount of traffic. I'm not sure in which direction you exited the Esplanade this afternoon, but if it was to move onto Connells Point Road, you would have seen the difficulties with traffic being parked cars on Connells Point Road and the fact that you need to egress more than halfway out onto Connells Point Road, that's hugely dangerous, particularly if you're going to have small children in the car. Um, Nearly finished, Ms. Crook. Ms. Crook. I am. Thank you. Um, I, I just, and my last we'll take your time. Thing, my last thing, um, the, the traffic is only going to increase too once Morris College is, is, um, is complete. Um, I, I, in reading the, the the changes and whatnot that came through um, to address the panel, um, I noted that it, it said that the SEP overrides the Cobra local plan. If I can use a, a, a cricket analogy, and I don't know because I have a cricket background, and I don't know why this doesn't happen with all local councils. I understand that the SEP is the overriding governance. Yep. Why then have a Cobra local plan if it can't supplement or um, you know, deal with local issues where the SEP is silent on the number of children in a childcare centre and the COGRA plan has a number, why then is the SEP overriding if the COGRA is to do with the local area? It's, it's obviously something that can't be addressed here. It's, it's a state issue, I would imagine, to deal with then local governance. But I, I just think it's wrong. As I said to you this afternoon, I, I don't have a problem with childcare centres. My son is a childcare worker. What I have a problem with is the size and the number of children that this centre proposes for our small area. 
which has seven childcare centres within a one kilometre radius. It is a glut. We don't need it. Right. Thank you. Please remain seated and I'll see if there are any questions to the panel. Thank you. Firstly, I'll just make an observation about the, or, um, your comments about the state policy and the, the council policy. It's to the level of any inconsistencies. So it's not as if the state policy overrides everything the council has. But no, where there's inconsistencies, it will. That's I all. understand. It's like, the, I mean, yeah. for, as I said, for cricket, we everybody has to go by the MCC laws of, of cricket. Right. Local associations, of which I used to be the association secretary, have local rules that create... There's generic and rules and then there's local rules. There's, there's Yeah, the local yeah. rules. And, and obviously the COGRA plan is a local rule to supplement the overriding. Yep. But why can't they work together? That's clearly not working together when one is silent and one has a number. Understood. I'll just see if there's any questions to the panel. No questions. Any no questions? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> Our next um, submitter is Poppy Constantakis. Please come forward. Please take a seat, ma'am. Sorry, you are? Okay, moral support? Yes. Okay, it's okay, you can hold hands. Would you shake it again? It's fine. Thank you. The is yours. My name's Poppy Constantakis. I am the owner of number two, the Esplanade, where I live with my family of six. I am an educator, understand the importance of early childhood education. I've raised four children who have used early childhood um, facilities and our street clearly objects on the basis that it is an unsuitable site for this development rather than a case of not in our backyard. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon and to highlight once again why we feel number four, the Esplanade, is not at all a suitable site for a commercial enterprise of this size. 68 children plus staff plus the parents that will be dropping them off and picking them up daily. We believe it's unsuitable on the basis that the Esplanade is a carriageway less than eight metres wide. It currently cannot support two cars passing safely. Uh, it currently cannot deal with traffic congestion and parking um, that we have. The addition of this facility would increase that and some foresight to please understand that in five months, we have not only Connells Point Public School feeding onto Connells Point Road, but a high school that is opening a block away from this proposed development, Maris College. When that traffic hits Connells Point Road, it will be absolute standstill and an inability for people to access not only their own properties, but Connells Point Road to get to bus stops, um, train stations and the like. The traffic, sorry, the report to panel does not provide evidence that council has given written notice to roads and maritime services of traffic generating development uh, as is required for a facility of more than 50 students and this proposed development is such a facility. If that um, evidence, uh, sorry, if that notice was given, the outcome from the RMS or a report or recommendation from the RMS has not been made available to residents to see. Sorry. The proposed development's play areas, outdoor play areas, are 190 metres from significant telecommunication towers, which is not within the recommended 300 metres. Uh, if the Hurstville DCP considers this unsafe, then approving this development would mean that 68 children daily play outdoors in an unsafe area. The design does not meet state and local requirements for 68 children. The proposed basement car park significantly exceeds the building footprint by over 50% in fact. It's actually not a basement at all. It's more a significant underground car park taking up the entire block, a thousand square metres, needing excavation from front to back, uh, far exceeding the requirement for minimising cut and fill. Additionally, we feel there's insufficient setback of the building, uh, where the recommendation is the average of the two properties that are adjoining would put the setback at 10.3 metres. This proposed development has a setback of only 5.5 metres. 
There is insufficient landscaping in a street like the Esplanade where you saw this afternoon landscaping is significant in every household. It's required to have 40 per cent, but only 32 uh, per cent is provided. If adjustments were made to this development so that it does comply with all state and local requirements, it would mean a reduced, significantly reduced number of children in that facility in the outdoor and outdoor space indoor outdoor spaces and the car park. Panel, you have a report in front of you from Council that states that this is a compliant development and the objectors, 25 people that object, are struggling to understand that as we feel it, it simply does not, not comply in a number of areas. I employ, implore each of you individually and your group collectively to please overturn Council's recommendation to approve this development. It does not comply and will detrimentally affect the families that live on the Esplanade. 25 individual submissions explained in detail how we will be impacted and where we feel it doesn't comply. Thank you for listening and we eagerly await your decision. Right. Thank, thank you. Um, I'll just see if there's any questions to the panel. I'm sorry if I spoke fast, but two minutes is not enough to try and condense everything we wish to say. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Um, our next submitter, um, speaking on behalf of the applicant, Gary Finn, Sydney Access Consultants. Please come forward, sir. Hi, my name's Gary Finn. I'm an architect. Um, Mr Finn, I, no doubt you've heard the submissions of the neighbours, so yeah. if you could uh, also turn your mic on as well, I'll allow you some extra time to do that. Um, I'm here to support the uh, planning report yeah. and uh, we have no objection to those matters that it's deferred for. Um, I, on hearing the objections from the neighbours, I'm not uh, quite sure where we don't comply because the planning report thinks that we do and we certainly, when we lodged the application, did our calculations, thought that we did. Uh, so I'm not sure about that. The um, maximum capacity is uh, related to the site area and a relationship between the number of vehicles we can install, the landscape area that's available and the internal <coughs> play area that we can uh, accommodate. So we build a relationship on that and that gives us a, a, you know, the maximum number of children. Whether that number of children occupy the building or not is a matter of commerce, whether the um, market will um, provide um, children for those places remains to be seen. Um, and other than that, I'm here just to answer your questions if you have any. Okay, yes, I think there might be a few questions, Mr Finn. I'm, I certainly have one in relation to the drawing uh, which shows in elevation the acoustic wall and the, um, the, 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 the metal deck carbonate acoustic fence. Can you explain a little bit about uh, to the panel a little bit uh, of detail around that concerning the, the type of finish? Uh, the, the angle it would, would appear to be at about what about a 30 degree angle? Is that, that about right? That's, that's uh, subject to the revision that the um, planning report has advised. Yeah. And, uh, and certainly uh, we were guided by advice from the acoustic consultant yep. and, uh, and uh, it certainly isn't something aesthetically that I would seek to do. Um, it's, uh, um, and I'm happy that Council have uh, asked us to try and lower the roof and uh, we've amended our drawings currently showing something that's relatively flat, almost flat, 2.4 metres high, no yep. higher than that. Um, and we've put screen planning down the side and across the front um, boundary using uh, using plants that the landscape architect have recommended. Those documents we've prepared, but uh, we need to get advice again from the acoustic engineer to make sure that uh, that structure uh, meets the acoustic requirements of the council's control. So um, the drawing shows something that um, we weren't particularly happy with either, but um, we were responding to advice from the acoustic engineer and. Uh, and uh, you know, we're, we're looking to minimise the impact of that of that uh, area. And if I could also ask you, when you took on this brief to design this building, did you have regard to the context of the street? I mean, I heard your submission about, well, you know, I've got a thousand square metres of land, I can put a building of X proportion on it. But I mean, did you well, the do a site analysis to, to look at the context of the street and where it is within its setting? 
Notwithstanding the fact that it's permissible, we understand that. We did, and we looked at the size of the adjoining dwellings and, and the structures in that area, yep. and uh, and we looked at where the best location <coughs> might be for a child play area, whether at the rear or down one side or towards the front of the site, and, yep. and how to minimise that impact. And uh, the visual impact we thought would be best um, approached in the way that we've done it by reducing the uh, the front elevation to um, basically half the width of the building that's adjoining, which is a residential two-storey building, um, and. Uh, the child play area down one side using acoustic attenuation methods, mm. I think, came up with the best result for it. I think the street's a little wider than, um, than uh, like the aerial photos show parking uh, vehicles on both sides and, and, and room to pass on either side. And, and I appreciate that when garbage trucks and things come down the road, they obstruct things that's part of life. But we, we um, are looking to move as many vehicles as we can off the off the street and uh, so that children can exit their vehicles and enter the childcare centre in the safest way. All right, so um, let me ask you about the um, the actual overall footprint of this building, the actual building itself. You're comfortable that that is within context of what the surrounding locality shows or has? <coughs> I think it is, given the size of the land and the propensity these days for us to take parcels of land like that and, and increase the density on them. Um, it certainly doesn't, isn't reflected in the 1960s development uh, pattern, but um, the current pattern of development, it, it uh, falls well within the, the typical range of things that we're doing these days, yes. Right, okay. Um, any other questions, panelists? Yeah. If, um, if I could just ask, with the... Um, the acoustic fence on the northern side, I, I think he said, look, it's not what you'd want, but uh, required by the acoustic engineer. In looking at the impacts then of that fence on the adjoining property, it is it is quite a long fence and at a height, which I think will be close to the sill height of the, um, uh, the windows on the house next door. But yet the landscape area adjacent to it is about 800 millimetres wide and I, I, I just can't see the capacity to be able to provide reasonable landscaping in there to provide some sort of a, um, a buffer to the adjoining property. Um, so was there any consideration given to, um, I, I guess, the capacity to provide reasonable landscaping and the setbacks along that area? Well, yes, and, and again, I wasn't happy with the, and neither was Council, with the pro proposition for the existing uh, acoustic attenuation methods. So uh, what we've currently um, revised the drawing to is a is a structure that's 2.4 .4 high and, and about the same distance off the boundary. Um, so 1.8 metre high fence, uh, set back 800, 2.4 is less than 45 degrees, so it's kind of, it's kind of, you know, hardly visible from the, from the uh, neighbour. However, what the landscape architect has proposed down that side is to, uh, is to plant some um, yellow stem of bamboo kind of growth, and and that uh, should grow vertically. It's not a, it's not one of those invasive bamboos, but um, one that will stay within the land and uh, stay where it's put. Uh, along with uh, jasmine, um, the climber, to uh, soften the feel of that uh, structure right down that side and across the front of the, we put a planter box over the front of the garage entry, which will pick up the same sort of language in terms of screening. So I think that'll soften it quite a bit down that edge. Um, you mentioned that you weren't happy with the acoustic assessment or recommendations from the acoustic engineer. Um, is that a result of the actual the overall size of the building? So in other words, if you came up with a perfect solution from an acoustic point of view and tried to incorporate that, incorporate that into your architectural outcome, would you have ended up with a smaller development? The, uh, the location of the, and the height of the fence initially is, uh, and, and still, is a direct response to the location of the upper level windows on the adjoining building. So you want to screen a child play area uh, by line of sight kind of thing. Um, uh, so that canopy uh, obstructs the line of sight kind of uh, vocal noise from uh, a person, a child, sitting in the playground area um, down that northern side. and, and uh, so it, 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 uh, if we put the playground at the rear instead of down the side, then we still have that problem. 
and if we put it in the front, we would still have that problem. So I think the uh, acoustic attenuation treatment, um, one way or another, uh, um, uh, you know, it's being put there to try and protect the neighbour's interest um, more than anything else. I also ask you about a plan of management for the actual operation of this centre. I mean, I note that there are conditions um, recommended before us today that deal with numbers of children and hours and so on and so forth. But with respect to a plan of management to deal with the deliveries of services to the centre, uh, protocols in place where there's complaints made by any of the residents about car parking, traffic, um, driveways being blocked, all of the typical things that appear to be synonymous with, with childcare centres within residential zones. Um, is that something you've turned your mind to as well? It's not something I'm an expert in, so that sort of thing we um, tend to leave to the applicant, who's uh, uh, in this instance, the applicant's uh, a very experienced um, uh, deliverer of child services, and uh, they've put together a management plan Okay. Um, which I've not, I've not looked at, but um, right. we, you know, I, I, I'm aware that uh, to reduce uh, the impact on the neighbour, they they cycle, uh, you know, a smaller number of children out in the play area and so mm. on. Uh, appear, you know, at any one time, they might have a reduced number, yeah. and they certainly don't have them playing outside all day long. So, yeah. so there's kind of breaks in the in the thing, and and for deliveries and so on, uh, you know, that, again, that's sort of. Uh, being controlled by um, our basement arrangement, which is, is one of the reasons it's there. And is there any security arrangements with respect to the building? I mean, after hours? Um, that I don't know. So we'll have electronic secure, security right. of some kind, and, and the garage areas got a roller door, a shower. Yeah, okay. All right, um, any other further questions? Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to ask, am I reading it right that the acoustic fence is sitting on top of a 900 retaining wall down in that side as well? Um, no, it's, a, it's noted here on the landscape plan that the garden bed is down behind a 900 millimetre retaining wall, it's, which is... It's 2.4 above the natural ground, I believe. That's natural ground. Yeah. And it's sloping up the side? Yeah. Okay. Right. Sorry, if we could just clarify that point. So, so with the natural ground level, which I take to be the dashed line yep. there, just wondering what that height is likely to be. Is that the... That's that's been reduced since... Uh, reduced by 600. That's, that's as Council's uh, preferred condition yes. of consent yeah. says, reduce it to 2400. And that's exactly what we'll do. But what I'm, I'm just wondering what that potential height is as it would adjoin the neighbouring property. 2.4 in accordance with the council's deferred condition. That, that, that height there. Yeah. So, so it was shown at three metres? Yeah. So you take 600. It was much higher before. Right. So that's a maximum of 2.4 to yeah. that point there. Yeah. You didn't prepare any 3D montages or anything? We have prepared. Uh, this is a ARCHICAD 3D kind of model. So um, yeah, we can, we can share it if that's useful in minutes. All right, John, no questions. All right, thank you. Thanks for your submission. Um, that concludes that, that item. The decision will be taken uh, later on today by the panel and, and published on the Council's website. So moving to the next uh, matter on the agenda, which is number 11, Arnold Street, Peakhurst. We have registered to speak uh, Anna Katos. Please come forward. Yeah. Was all yours. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Katos and I reside at number five Hunnell Street in Peakhurst. I am registering my formal objection to the proposed development. My objections are based on many issues with the proposed site and the ne negative impacts that is associated. The site is too small, the size and scale of the proposed development is too large and inappropriate for being in the middle of an existing residential homes. This is a boarding house being proposed with 11 rooms two storeys high. That is 11 plus people residing in this home, in this boarding house, um, with a, a manager's room is what's been added. Uh, there's already not enough parking on the street for the residents on the 
Street. I understand that you did a site visit today between those hours. Come, come at seven, eight o'clock at night when everyone's home. There's no parking on the street as it is. Then add 11 plus cars. That's just unacceptable. <coughs> um, this is a low, low density residential zone. If any other resident was to apply to build a new home at this same size and scale, it would be rejected. Uh, if a business um, if any business applied to build a new facility, facility with grossly inadequate parking, that would also be deemed. So, can I just, can you just drag that microphone over? Because we're having to typically get the audio. Which way towards me? Yeah, towards you. So yeah. you can, so? you can just pick it up. There. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, um, Sorry to interrupt your train of okay. thought. That's all right. Um, this same uh, application with some variations were, uh, was put by the panel two years ago exactly on the 17th of August 2017 and my husband and I spoke at this panel meeting with the same objections that we hold today. We have a young family, we have built our dream home in this street and now it's being completely undermined and the value of that property has completely gone down given the fact that this boarding house is being proposed two years ago and then again today, like for this year as well. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. All right. Thank you. So I'll see if there are any questions of the panel. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Speaking on um, behalf of the applicant, we have George Murad. And uh, Melissa Rodriguez, is that correct? Yes. yes, please, please, both of you can come up. We'll extend you the, the time frame for you to talk. That's fine. I'll leave it up to you to Thank you. work out who's going first. <laughs> Good afternoon, members of the panel. I am the town planner here on the project. I'd like to start by saying we are incredibly disappointed with the recommendation by council officers to use this application. Having read the report, there are a number of items in there that we can address and make amendments to the plans to overcome the concerns of council. I will elaborate on these points. Our architect, George, is here today. He will elaborate on the design considerations as well. With that in mind, we do ask that the panel consider deferring the matter so that we can make these changes. If I can start by referring to page 85 of Council's report. Okay, just bear with us and we'll go to page 85 and you can step us through it. Okay, okay where are we? Okay, so looking at the table for the landscape area. Yep. Council's raised in their comments that we are raising the ground level by approximately 1.2 metres to the front portion of the site. We disagree with that comment. If you refer to our sections, if you do have the plans there, it's DA013. Okay, hold on. This, this, this okay. You can see that at the street, there's an RL of 28.879 at the boundary. Is that right, George? Oh, that's why you put this to 12. Yeah, that's why I put this to 13, sorry. Sorry, where are you taking us to? So if you go to drawing number 13 again. 13. Yep. You can see at the street, there's an RL of 28.879. Yep, got that. And that rises to 29.579, <laughs> which is a rise of just 700 mil, not the 1.2 metres described by council. The reason I wanted to refer to the A12, because we've got a section straight through the guts of the purported fill. All right, so we're looking at the top section. So section A, I guess. Yep. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking uh, so once we get to the built form, if you like, that we've met natural ground. Okay? And we're just essentially carrying that datum and bringing it forward. This, if I may say, just for clarity's sake, this has nothing to do with the OSD. This is an aesthetic movement. 
and it's to mirror, we'll get to that later, there's other references even in the street, two doors down that have done the same. So uh, insofar as presentation to street, we're only talking about 700 millimetres. I think the reference to the 1.2, I guess. The 1.2 metres does occur further into the site, and that's beyond the 4.5 metre front setback. So if you refer to the ground floor plan, might be best. All right. So just, I know that you've looked at these plans. Yeah. You, you're now <laughs> making a submission in front of us. We need to follow what you're saying. So what you're saying, Mr Murad, is that the, uh, the reference point of uh, 28879 uh, moving up to 29.979, the 700 mil, that's reflected in this re little retaining wall. Is that correct? Essentially, yes. yes. So that's the reference point, the referable points between drawing 12 and drawing 13. Is that right? And that is that reflects the extent of the fill right. um, in, the in the front area. Now, bear in mind, I've spoken to the engineers, and they're happy to reduce that by 300 millimetres, but I... I'm doing this from an aesthetic standpoint. I the OSD is in here, isn't it? Yeah, it's an above ground OSD. Correct. So it's about absorption essentially into the natural ground. It's not a tank, it's, it's just not a tank. No, it's just soil a, planting. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. All right, okay, thank you. Right. Yeah, panelists, are we clear about that? Yep, yep, okay. okay. Please proceed. So the 1.2 metres that Council is referring to actually occurs further back into the front setback. If you can please turn to the ground floor plan. You'll see a plant. Hold on. Yes, yeah, that's fine. to this. I have actually rehearsed your, your submission. No. <laughs> so, so what, what drawing number is that one? That would be drawing number six. Yep. Okay, so we're in the ground floor plan. Plan view, yes. Yep. So within that front setback, you can see the plant box just in front of the stairs. Yes. That's where the 1.2 metre fill occurs. Okay. We clear on that one, panel? That's Good. outside of the four and a half metre front setback required by council. <laughs> and it's also occurred due to the neighbouring tree. You can see on that same plan, yep. the neighbouring tree with the tree protection zone mapped around it. Uh, and that's why we've sought to limit the excavation in that in right. that area. Okay, that's the jacarina tree. Yes. Right. Okay. So, as part of the arborist report, uh, if we we are apologies in advance because we probably should have started with an apology in advance. We are going we're to get this to clarify. We're going to be dancing between. That, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But just you know, yeah, we'll, we'll take we'll us step it through it slowly so we understand your submission properly. If we jump to DA ten. I'm assuming that the 1.2 metres referred to uh, is that black space that we're seeing in DA10 is elevation west, okay, where the stairs are. So, yeah, so it's this area in here. That's correct. Right. Now that exists, its sole purpose essentially exists yeah. to allow for the slab to be suspended over piers in select space, with select spacing to allow for the jacarandas roots to continue making their way through. And natural course. We've, if memory serves me, we've got an encroachment into the SRZ of at about 20%. So we're well, we're actually below targets. We're well within that the range. Arborist recommendations. The arborist recommendations. Or the tree protections of the yes. TPZ. Yes. 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 So um, it's designed, that won't be filled at the end of the day, ultimately, to allow for that movement. Okay. Now, had it not been for that obviously everything would have been shifted back even further but uh, it works from that perspective it's also if i may if we just take a moment to absorb the topology of the site the natural ground the movement of it from front to back or back to front essentially when, when i approach any any project i try to minimize or mitigate cut and fill or balance the site so i'll take a line essentially take a bit from the back a bit from the front look to what is surrounding. Um, the 700 is actually a direct reference to, I think it's, we've got it in here, I think it was number seven. Numbers five and seven. Yeah, has the retaining wall sitting above street level to about, to the tune of about 700 mil. We do have some images here. Of the so DA12, 
it is is based on the the fill level of the neighbours. No, the I mean the facade essentially, the right. presentation of the landscaping to the street. So that seven hundred mil uh, masonry rendered retaining wall, if you like, with the raised landscaping is a reference to the neighbour two doors down. Okay. If I may get into the aesthetic just for a moment. Just remember that we don't have a half an hour, of so course, please. I did want to present the grass. No, that's all right. Visually, it, and the hydraulic engineer has, has allowed. OSD is still working if we drop it 300 mil. But bear in mind, then we're actually below natural, we're actually cutting it. So it's that balance between, finding that balance, that marriage between cut and fill. And I, find, I feel that yeah, we've made that. We've, uh, we've found the, the midpoint in that. I'm cutting in on your time. No, that's fine. <laughs> Under that same table, Council refers to the platform lifts. Okay, so now we're back to the report. Back to yes. The report. The concern's been raised that the platform lift is with forward of the building line. Page 85. 85, yes. So what we've done to mitigate that, we do have landscaping that wraps around that element. So it's not something that's being read immediately to the street. And it integrates with the remaining deep soil planting within that front setback. So there is that compatibility going through the street, as George pointed out, numbers five to seven further down do have the 700 mil raised to the street and then landscaping. So we have that consistency in the character. If you want to see that visually, if I may go, we can refer back to the hotel. So that's elevation of rest. All right, okay, next point. I will say too on the landscaping that we do have greater front setbacks than required by the DCP. So it's a minimum of 4.5 under the DCP. We're at 10 metres to the front building line. Uh, the minimum setback is six and a half metres to the stair. And that's just allowed that extra planting of turf. And we do have a substantial tree as well at the centre of the site. So we are reinforcing the landscape character again through those setbacks. If I can move forward to page 86 of Council Office's report. Yep. So looking at solar access. The first part of these comments refer to solar access to the communal living room. And the officer actually acknowledges that we do comply with the requirements of the set to the communal living room in that we do have the three hours as by virtue of the northern orientation and yep. the large glazed panel to the void. We are able to increase that further should the panel or council require. The only reason we have limited the size of the glazing to the northern and eastern facades at this point was in consideration of fire engineering aspects. So given the building class, any glazing within three metres of the boundary would have to be fire treated, hence the glass blocks to the eastern side. But we can design around that and have sprinklers or drenches attached to those windows and have that glazing increased. We do have some elevational shadow diagrams prepared in the package you have, which would show that those windows would be bathed in sunlight, improving the amenity to those rooms. Are you referring to a plan? This is a plan. It's <coughs> a drawing number. So drawing number 15. 15, yes. So essentially the opportunity to increase these, to encroach three metres set under the BCA. So that will activate the need for a fire engineered solution, but obviously they're going to be based. In light. 15, I don't have a 15. Shut it, I go. It's a 3D. The 3D. Just to assist, we had it even done elevation. Oh, I'll show sure I have that. Right. Is Jim Paul's ask a question while on the Yeah, sure. Here. Uh, solar access. Yes, Just wondering if you could explain to us the the, the um, site planning or design approach that you've taken, um, particularly you know in relation to solar access and amenity for units. Um, what one thing I can see is that by placing the stairs and the services on the northern side. Um, 
that effectively um, very few of the living areas of units are going to have direct sunlight during uh, midwinter. I'm just wondering, is that something that was considered as part of the design approach? Very much so, if I may be frank. The initial DA that uh, was rejected some time ago was a completely different design. This was this, the, the two separate buildings with the centralised communal, uh, was essentially the, the outcome of that initial meeting in, the, in my post-mortem, if you like, with the planner, with the council planner. So the recommendation to split the buildings and allow that solar channel through the middle. Now, I can appreciate, I mean, I don't, I, if I may say from the top, I don't use the set, I use it as a minimum standard. I don't use it as, because I've done a lot of these. Um, I don't use it as my standard for amenity. I'll always try and just pass that wherever possible. So as an example, to the, uh, the ground floor, um, the two accessible units get private open space, which does get direct solar access. And they have both, they also get the benefit of the, uh, one of them does get the sliding door. Is that private open space not south facing now? So south facing, but it will receive. So if we look to the elevational shadow diagrams in 3D, uh, we can read that they will actually receive that. So even though that isn't uh, a control, I still would like to try and achieve it. And so the, the controls stipulate that we need to get the solar in some community room. Don't want that to be all I need to achieve. Type of thing. Had, had you thought of putting the living areas on the northern side? I did explore. I can. That is one of the things that I wish there wasn't a re uh, recommendation for refusal if there was a discussion prior. Because that is something that could easily be explored. Um, because we can fit the bathrooms, for example. If we, I'm going to go back to the wall if you to. So, if these switched out to here, but we, better, we do have to bear in mind that we are talking about the accessible units, okay? Um, I, mean, I, 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 think it's, it's, I think it might be fair to say when we we're on site today, and, and Michael and I commented, it surprised us that you didn't just try to move this building forward and get more light into this central courtyard and put those stairs and access to the rear of these units. So, in effect, mirroring the thing mm. or the development might make more sense to get solar access to these apartments because yeah. there'll be pretty miserable light coming into some of those rear apartments. The rear apartments? Mm. And potentially the front units where you're behind I, the I mean, screen. I looked at the front back. units thinking that, um, <clears> but <throat> so far as the rear, where are we? Right, um, I, I don't want to cut you off, but oh, we yes. have to keep moving along. Okay. So if there's any... That is something, though, if I may, that is something that we, we're willing to explore because it is... It is right. able to be done. And there's opportunity let's, for let's, skylights as well. Let's agree yeah. that that's where we're at. Yep. That. Can we move on to the next <coughs> point, please? The last point that I was going to touch on was the character test described in the report. Can I just pass this? I went through this exercise just to help assist the discussion. These are just some photographs of development in the street. Thank you. In, not in, just in the street, just and in the surroundings. Here we go. Oh, no, everyone's got a couple. Everyone's got a couple. So, one of my questions in relation to that, when you look at the, the, the street elevation, is that where did you take your cues from to come up with this, this concept? Conceptually, okay. We can all we can throw around the word design future character because the street is yes. old. Um, I mean, there's, there's one that's under construction, for example, not far away, okay, which I was frightened by the, the amount of queues that we share. Um, but insofar as the street is concerned, it's still on its way. The only development that essentially that's taken place in the street is land and housing. So um, they're all assets by land and housing and they're, they're multi-dwelling housing. That's all that's really taken place in terms of new development in the street, apart from number six, which is opposite slightly to the left if we're looking out to the street. So we have number six and six A presenting that very angular, very squared off form, the flat roof sort of character facade. Yeah. 
So I can refer to that lightly insofar as the use of... I, I, louvers are part of our signature because of their ability to create a little bit of privacy as well as passive surveillance opportunity, uh, as well as something that's striking. I, like, I do like to have just a degree of controversy in the design, something that creates interest or discussion. Not to uh, offend, but at least to say this is a step forward. Uh, but it is always going to be in a sub uh, subjective discussion. All right, so I think we, um, we understand your submission and for the purposes of keeping this meeting going, mm -hmm. um, we take it that you're seeking the panel's deferral of this DA to allow you to come back to the Council with further submissions to address the shortcomings of what's been mentioned in the report. Am I close to that? least to have that yeah. discussion after the right. Okay. All right. Well, if that's where we're at, um, I'll just ask the panel to see if there's any further questions. Yes, Mr. Um, Mr. Brock, um, in relation to the proposed uh, vertical metal louvre on the, on the street-facing plane, uh, that, that presents quite a, quite a substantial flat surface, flat dark surface facing the street. Um, and uh, yeah, it could be seen as representing quite a strong visual disruption to the street, mm -hmm. uh, combined with the point that my colleague made around why the, uh, the, the staircases are, loaded, uh, are located at the front, why that screen's there and what the effect on natural light is, uh, would you have considered uh, an opportunity for moving that staircase elsewhere uh, and having an opportunity for uh, a less intrusive view from the street? I suppose and at the same time, uh, also looking at the advantages of creating greater solar access to uh, the courtyard and the, and the rear part of the property. Okay. The, this goes straight to why we've danced between plans so much. You can't move one thing without it affecting another. And ultimately, the building itself is well below height, but we're being spoken to as having too much bulk and scale. Now, moving the building forward means we have to raise the building. We have a basement to contend with here. And that's going to mean more cut and more fill all over the place because it's accessible. There isn't a, a spot on this block of dirt that isn't accessible by a wheelchair. Okay, and that's a very critical thing when we look to the, the FFLs surrounding the entire site. Um, it goes to the core of, I do see that communal space being a genuine communal space. As I said, we I've referred to earlier, we've designed a lot of these and I think that's very important that there is that crashing space that people can bump into each other and have a conversation. Um, and I see that that's potentially going to be quite successful here. Now, to speak to the other point, I do want to refer you to the, just in here with the 3D, considering the, the elevation shadow diagram is sitting perched above, that's open at the top. Okay, that will be addressed with the clear sun type sort of UV rated, but a clear coating. Uh, so that northern light will get in there. I am happy. I'm happy, I'm happy to explore wider openings between the louvers. I, I think openings, that's a discussion for another exactly. day. Yeah. Um, because we have to keep moving on with our. Yeah, the last today. point of that, I did to your answer. Yes, I did consider circulation happening in the middle, oh. and went against it for two reasons. Number one, passive surveillance is quite successful when we're talking about that circulation space. People can walk out safely behind the, the cover of a louver, if you like, and just keep an eye on the street. That's number one. Number two, what I've learned in the past, centralised access mm. to a second storey potentially creates privacy issues to the neighbours or kills our opportunity to create what we've got here, and that's 100% cross-ventilation. So we'll either have to close them up. Right. Or, so that's, that's something learned from experience, something from the past. So I've found that that's the most successful way to deal with that from that perspective. I mean, right. Well, I repeat what I said earlier. It seems as though you um, are after a further discussion and dialogue with Council. I would have loved an approval, but <laughs> considering okay. it felt a bit awkward there. Right. Just <laughs> one quick question. As, as, as part of that deferral, are, are, you open, are you open to like quite a significant redesign of the project? Not just a tinker here and a tinker there, but... I think some, some of these issues that have been raised, particularly around um, the streetscape and the amenity of units in relation to solar access, 
I, I, I can see the potential for quite a radical redesign being I'm required, and, and I'm just wondering whether or not, when you're asking for it to be deferred, mm -hmm. are you intending that there be some significant redesign, or are you just looking to make some minor changes? I mean, Michael, we're looking for an approval, um, and we've never approached council from an adversarial standpoint. I'm not, I'm not no, suggesting, no, no, I'm not suggesting that. that, that, that there, there's there's a fact and degree as to yes. where we can go with this development application. Mm -hmm. Because if what Mr Levy is saying is mm. what you're going to propose, something which is substantially different to what we're, we're looking at today, it may constitute a withdrawal of this application and then you submit fresh plans. I'd like to see how, why it would have to go to that degree. Well, it could. Oh, it could. Is a discussion, obviously, if we're open we're to open discussion. We're open to discussion. Well, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Um, as a panel here, we're not, we don't have the jurisdiction or the power to deal with amendments on the run. Um, certainly, we, we're not entertaining any of this, uh, this fresh material as an amendment to your DA, so we, we don't have jurisdiction to deal with that as, as it is. So, um, unless there's anything further you need to put to us, um, we'll uh, make a decision that will be published on the Council's website. Sure. All right. So thank, thank you for your time. Thank you. That concludes that matter. Um, moving to the next matter on the agenda, which is uh, 711 Short Street South Percival. We have registered to speak um, objecting to the application, Mr Murray Roberts. Mr Roberts, are you here? Please come forward, sir. Okay, um, my name is Murray Roberts, and I, I'll be living. <coughs> I live directly across the road from uh, Seven to Eleven Short Street. And um, earlier, I, I did lodge a formal submission with the council, explaining my full reasons for objecting against the development. Uh, so I don't plan to go through them all again tonight. I think the panel's got full access to that that uh, that submission. We do. Okay. So all I wish to do tonight is to. Um, just mention, just, just to remind you of the seven main points that I raised. <clears throat> okay, so that is that, that these are that the building is too high, uh, my privacy will be compromised, my view will be compromised. Slow down. Sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. The building is too high. I believe it's too high. My privacy will be compromised. Yep. My view will be compromised. <clears throat> my amenity will be compromised. The building will compromise existing infrastructure. And one thing I'm not sure about, which I asked the council to check, but they haven't got back to me, is that the block may include a heritage listed property. That's our number 11. We believe it was the first home of the um, the first station master of Hurstville. So we're not sure about that. Is the that. subject site, you're saying? The subject site, yeah. yeah. Number 11, the, the actual house. So it's one of the houses. And that was all I wanted to say tonight. All right. I'll just see if there's any questions for the panel, panelists. No. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Our next submitter, um, on behalf of the applicant, uh, we have the owner and the applicant, Ahmed uh, Taleb. Mr. Taleb, please come forward. And um, do we have the architect, Mr. Kidamidris? He's present. He's present. Please come forward, sir. Yeah. Might be just more convenient for both of you here. All right, gentlemen, I'll leave it up to you who wants to go first. I'm happy to go first. All right. Thank you, Mr. Taleb. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to actually discuss this application today. Uh, there is a few things that I did want to raise, if that's all right with the panel. Um, the first thing is that this, this application was actually submitted back in 2017. Um, it's had a number of planners that have actually gone through this pan, uh, this application. I think num this is number eight. Um, I have nothing against Martin at all. Um, you know, I understand he's just inherited this project about a month ago. Um, the issue is the previous planner that was responsible for this project, Mr. Ramiz uh, Gurgis, um, in February, um, the architect Michael actually spoke to him and uh, he verbally said essentially that it's ready for approval and it will be listed for an application hopefully within March once he finishes his report. Yeah. Um, we didn't hear anything. We were patient throughout the whole period. We understood the actual changes in council and we're more than happy to accommodate with that and uh, allow that to happen. But um, 
what happened essentially is um, we were all caught off guard. On the 1st of August, we were notified by council essentially saying um, there's a number of issues that have been raised and um, the project is no longer compliant. Um, just so uh, the panel actually realises, these were all fresh allegations, nothing that we had actually been previously identified. Um, we had, weren't given an opportunity to actually rectify any of those issues. Um, well, can I say, look, I, I, I understand that you know, you've, you've been here for some time, but um, if you could address the, um, the matters that have been raised by this report, and I'm sure you will, because um, the panel has no awareness of the, the carriage of this matter through no, the that, that's, that's fine. Um, so I think that there's major issues in relation to the FSR and the setbacks of the uh, project itself. Uh, just in relation to the FSR, um, this was just recently identified and the issue is it doesn't actually comply. Uh, there's a the cases of Danks uh, which supports what actually is considered external floor space or anything else. Um, Council is actually realising other cases, which is the case of Sucrose and I think it's Landmark. Uh, the issue is, the difference within those cases is um, it wasn't actually open. Um, it was considered it was a closed area and that's why it actually formed part of the actual floor space ratio. Uh, the difference in this case is um, if it was to rain, or anything, rain would actually come in and wet that whole area for our development plan. Um, the other issue, and I'll be very quick for the panel, is in relation to the setback. Um, I've been referred to the actual C2 medium density housing guide, uh, which I know was done in 2013 prior to actually any of the amendments um, and the actual rezoning of all the area within uh, Georgia River Council. And even in this one, um, it is back from 2013, it, it refers to a multi-storey dwelling. Um, I do realise that this is actually a residential flat building. Um, I know the architect will get into that into more detail, but um, essentially, my understanding is that we complied with all the relevant um, criteria that thing. So my understanding was, you know, I could come to the panel and ask for a um, for an approval, if not a deferral, so we can actually consider some of the things that have been raised by council themselves. I think there isn't there an issue about there's no um, clause 4.6 written submission. Oh, that's a matter that, that, that you're going to address. I, I can answer that now. Yeah. There is no clause 4.6 for, for FSR or height, Mr Chairman, only because as far as we were concerned up until the time we got a copy of this report, we, we understood that we were compliant with the FSR and oh. with, the, with the setbacks and with the height. Um, okay. so, so the issue that we have with those items is the way they're calculated and the way they're measured. So the methodology of how it's calculated, you you have concerned me. That's correct. And I can explain that further. Okay. Well, that, that's kind of fundamental to where we're at today, correct. because um, if it's the case that the clause 4.6 written requests are required and there isn't any, then jurisdictionally we have a problem. I understand that, uh, Mr. Chairman. But if we if if this issue was identified and we had time to mm. respond. Mm. Uh, and if it was the case that um, uh, our calculations were, or our methodology was incorrect, we would have uh, produced that clause 4.6 report. Right. So, so if I put so a proposition to you, and let's assume that you do require 4.6 written exceptions. Um, is it your submission today that you are also <coughs> seeking a deferral of this application to fix things up? Correct, yes. Right. Okay. All right. Sorry. Oh, look, uh, for, 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 I was simply going to say I concur with everything um, Aaron has said. Yeah. Um, there's been a long history to this application. Uh, there have been, we are up to planner number nine, uh, assessing planning from this council. Uh, we've had extensive discussions very early on uh, with the pre-DA uh, process. It's been to the design review panel. Uh, I'm repeating the obvious, but it's important to understand all these things. Every time uh, a recommendation or a comment was made to us, we attended to those expeditiously, and those uh, amendments are incorporated into the uh, into the plans that are before you today. There hasn't been anything that we were asked to do that we haven't done. And then all of a sudden, two years later, because it was submitted in August of 2017, mm. So exactly two years to the day, mm. we, we, we're confronted with this report for refusal. It just came out of completely out of left field with no time 
for us to address any of these issues. As far as I am concerned, most of this comes down to um, uh, uh, an interpretation of how things should be calculated. Uh, the GFA in the FSR is one, mm. one example of that. <clears throat> and basically subjective uh, uh, sub subjective opinions about, you know, aesthetics or, you know, those type of things. Yeah. If we had time to, if someone gave us this list a month ago and said, look, you know, these are, the, these are our concerns, of course we would have attended to each and every one of those and amended the plans accordingly. Right. But to be given this report all the, you know, with no warning, I, I think is a little bit... You feel a little it, bit ambushed. Uh, exactly. Absolutely ambushed, especially right. after a, a two-year wait. Again, the panel's not here to explain no, no, the I history of it. We but, don't. but Mr Chairman, it's important for you and the yes. panel to understand the mm. background to all of this. No, I appreciate you know, that. We, we do whatever we can. The, the client has spent a lot of money. Yeah. We do whatever we can to comply with, the, with these things. And, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, maybe, <coughs> maybe I should withhold my comments. I, uh, I think the issue is, especially in relation to that, so it's open to interpretation. The Land Environment Court has made numerous decisions for and against, um, with exact scenarios, opposite scenarios. Mm. So I think it's on a material basis on what you actually decide whether or not the actual plan, whether rain or actually any external element comes into the property or not. Right. Um, mind setting, if it does rain, the whole floor will be wet there. Um, it's not actually lube, as I think that which was the case in Landmark, uh, which actually closed the actual thing, so you, it would actually prevent anything from the outdoors. The issue with this one is it's actually thin beams that will actually, you right. can actually put your but hand through. It seems to me that you're after some due process here. You want to be heard. We, and, and also be given the opportunity to to amend some of this stuff. Right. I mean, I mean yeah. when you read through the report, you, you would think there is nothing about this application which is right. Uh, and and uh, that, that's how it's written, that's how it comes across to me. It's actually, in my view, it's actually um, not as bad as it as it sounds, and a lot of it can be easily fixed if, if we had the time. Yeah. Right. But the, the, the fundamental, um, the, the fundamental problems with this application is uh, how we um, how we view uh, or calculate FSR stroke GFA and setbacks. And with the setbacks, for example, uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> and I can, I've got it in writing. Um, going back to June of 2016, <coughs> June, you're told one thing. Exactly right. Yeah. So, so you know, we're, we're told um, uh, you know, it, it, this corner here is the problem. Um, uh, how about you uh, bring the building back to three meters and strengthen the corner? Mm. Aesthetically, mm. so we do that mm -hmm. uh, to compensate for the for the short for, <coughs> for, the, for the narrow setback. It was agreed that the um, setback along the along Short Street along the frontage yep. and also this part of the building at the back because it's an L shape effectively. So this part of the building faces Grove. Right, right. That's right. Instead of instead of those being at four and a half meters, we actually pushed them to five. So so uh, additional setback. Uh, front and side to make up for the corner being, ex you know, f um, set f further out to express it, to, to strengthen the corner and express it as an element. If, if, if I'm, Cause I, I think a lot of the changes sense. that are actually recommended by council, we don't actually <coughs> have an issue with it. Um, you know, we had a chat with Martin and a lot of those we can actually rectify. It's not an issue at all. It's just a matter of time. I think the main thing is, um, it's just in relation to the FSR and the setback, which were the two main issues. And, and then with the, and with the with the FSR again, if I just um, talk about the, the loopers that Aaron has raised, it was suggested by planner number six, I think. Um, wouldn't it be a good idea if you have some fixed louvers along the edge of the balcony, which is completely open? So we have these fixed louvers. Mm. Set, it hasn't been detailed, we'll probably set apart maybe 300 millimetres. These things are 200 millimetres wide, set, you know, set apart every 300 millimetres. You put your hand through it, like Aaron said, uh, to deal with privacy uh, from any future development on, on King George's Road. So we do that. And what happens? Because the louvers are there and because they encroach on the 1.4 metre height limit, it all of a sudden, the, the, the open balcony, the open breezeway becomes part of the GFA yeah. and the FSR. Yeah, I, I appreciate The design review that. panel told us to put a kitchen up on the roof and they thought it was a good idea to enclose the kitchen because it's up on level six. In a strong wind, things can go flying. <coughs> so, so we enclose it. 
And what happens? It is, it is Jeff. Yeah. If yeah. you take the door off and leave it completely open for birds and all sorts of other creatures to get in there, mm. then it's, it's, it's not a problem anymore. Right. It, it's, um, it seems to be... I don't want to cut you off, but I no think we, we do need to, we to move on. I think we understand your submissions. Um, I'll just see if there's any questions, panellists. Yeah, I've just got one, Chair. The, look, the, 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 the calculation of the breezeways on the GFA, even if the calculation was as you described, would you meet the floor space ratio? Yes, correct. And I can show you some other inconsistencies if you had another two, <coughs> two, two or three hours in the report and the way it's calculated. Which, which we know the panel does not have. Mm. All right. We didn't make this stuff up. And, and, and in fact, can I say, with the greatest respect, uh, the, the, the way I, I've dealt with this application is the same way that I deal with all applications across many other councils that I work, work in, and we have never had this problem. And all of a sudden we, have, we do have a problem, and not only that, but there's a, there's, a, there's a bit of a twist in the interpretation as well, where certain other things all of a sudden become uh, GFA and FSR, for example, open court limits. Are you able to quantify that? I'm sorry? Are you able to quantify, quantify that if, if you were to take the calculation of uh, the breezeways not being included in the GFA calc, would you, uh, to what, how many, what, how would that make? I, I believe we've done that um, along the way. We, 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 we do have, um, <clears throat> on, on page DA114 is where we set out all our calculations. I can do that in that session. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Okay, um, Mr. Lee. Yeah, I have, uh, I'm interested in the side setbacks yes. along the short street frontage. That's and DA 106. Good question. 106. I'll be very happy to talk about that. Which are uh, one, two, three habitable rooms. Correct. Uh, right. At three metres rising, I think yes. in the order of five storeys. <coughs> um, it appears to be substantially below the, um, the requirement uh, under the ADG and particularly taking that step further in terms of enabling um, uh, not, not only sort of privacy and minimising overshadowing, but also providing separation between building forms and particularly considering future development on that side. Sorry, uh, Michael, are you talking about levels one to where? Which levels is specifically are you talking about on that edge? This um, is it four and five, or is it just? Um, well, it's it's really all it's it's all. Okay, let, let me explain. So we have no problem, uh, according to the ADG, up to levels uh, for levels uh, uh, ground one, two, and three. But they're habitable rooms. <coughs> they are habitable rooms, but the set the setback is appropriate. And that has never that has not been challenged, not even by this council, not even in this report. I, I know that this this panel is actually considering your development application, and the ADG talks about setback, different setback requirements between habitable rooms yes. and non-habitable rooms, and up to twelve metres. There's a six metre requirement. Yeah, but these, are, these are not habitable rooms. These are non-habitable rooms. Living rooms, bedrooms. Well, you, 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 okay. Look. For, for ground first, second and third, these are the plans here. The only windows we have on the side are bathroom windows. And the setback here is three metres because they are non-habitable rooms. But it's, not, it's not just privacy, level, it's also about separation between building forms. So when you build on, on one side and then another side, that you've actually got some physical separation between buildings. On, I, I agree, there's got to be a separation, but it depends on the nature of the rooms. Our rooms are non-habitable. To, to that level. Where they become habitable is on levels four and five. And on levels four and five, it, which is where you're looking at, by mm -hmm. the way, yeah. we have bedrooms, we have a living room facing um, short street, and we have a bedroom that faces towards the rear. And this particular um, this particular setback is non-complying, but can I, can I read this to you? <clears throat> this is from the design review panel. Well, I'd, I'd rather you didn't, because what we're we're not considering the design review panel's report, but rather the report that's before us. Okay. We take on board what you're saying, as noted, and we can look at that later. 
just that we don't have the luxury of time okay. this evening. Otherwise, we'll be here till midnight. My only, again, I'm not trying to cut you off. My, but, only, my only point, Mr Chairman, yeah. is that this particular non-compliance has been addressed by the Design Review Panel right. and found to be acceptable. That's my point. All right. Well, we'll, we'll look at that. If it is not acceptable, we are happy to change it. All right. And I, and I understand that and as well. As far as the physical um, setbacks are concerned, three metres up to level, including level three, is correct because they are non-habitable roofs on our side. Yeah. And, and then we'll go to four and a half metres beyond that because they, uh, because of the height of the building. All right. Um, in particular, I had some concerns over units um, 406, 506 and 601, given the relative sizes of them being 35 square metres. They're studios. Yeah, well, they're tight. Well, studios can be 30. We're actually... Yeah. We're actually but that, that doesn't years. always translate into the right thing to do. Well... But that's... that's enough, that, I'm not going to labour that point at the moment because, obviously, the recommendation before the panel is to refuse your application outright. Yes. So, uh, again... When, when, the, when the ABG uh, calls up studios... Yeah, they're guides. 30, that's a guideline. Very good. Uh, it is a guide, and we can... As long as we remember that for all the other for all the other um, uh, issues that come up that are referred to the ABG. Yeah. Um, all right. With... Um, I think we might leave it there. I understand your submissions. We understand yeah. where you'd like to go with this application. Cameron, anything further? No. John? Yeah. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The decision will be taken um, later today and published on the council's website. So that concludes that matter. We're moving to the next matter which is 1 to 7 Bowens Road, Cogra. And registered to speak in relation to this matter is um, <coughs> firstly, Theresa Cott, objector. Please come forward, ma'am. Thank you. One of the first things that concerns me in the DA is that distances are misconstrued. The distance from Bones Road to Cogra Railway Station is given as 587 metres. That's perhaps if the crow flies straight and doesn't deviate for crossing a road or doing anything like that. The distance is more likely to be 650 metres. It could be 700. It all depends if you want to cross a road. Because one of the things that happens, you've got to sort of walk across the road to the other side to get to Cogra. That was easy. But the next statement says that it's 800 metres to Hurstville Station. Well, it could barely get you to Carlton Station, not to Hurstville Station. So when I see little mistakes like that, I always get worried about the next mistake. The distance from Bones Road to Hurstville Station is more in the region of 2.6 to 2.8 kilometres. Moving on to the next item. There is mention of the lift overrun. I couldn't actually read um, how big the lift overrun is, and that's my fault. The map on the website was just beyond my competence. What I was worried about is that the rooftop has been approved for residential accommodation. Now that's on page 183. Let's pretend there is a little mistake in terminology and it should be residence and all sorts of things. But it does say that there is a maximum solar access, well, I think that's sort of a given, it is on top of the building, and also that there is a minimum acoustic impacts. Well, just like the first item, this item, I would say in good old the castle way, we're dreaming. Because later on, we have a plan of management being proposed as bylaws. Those plans of management have got very little credibility. At the moment, we have already in legislation, Strata Management Act, that washing cannot be hung on balconies. And if you walk, uh, ride along, walk along Kensington Street, 
every one of those balconies has got washing hanging on it. So, and that isn't being controlled, that isn't being monitored, that isn't. So proposing a plan of management that's going to identify the maximum number of users on the roof, no amplified music incorporated into bylaws, I don't even believe it. They're, they're very nice words, it gives me a lovely feeling, but when you've got a kitchenette and toilet up there, People are going to gravitate up there in summer because it's just going to be pleasant. That then brings me back to the lift overrun, but I am more worried that the top floor will be used in summer for parties. How do I know this? Because I live in a strata unit in Cogra, and in summertime, people gravitate either to the balcony or they open their windows for cross ventilation or some air and the noise travels because it bounces between buildings and that's something I'll bring up at the last item of the echo between buildings. It's all very well for the first building to be put up and saying, you know, you can't see through a window into another window, past a window. But I live in a unit that's been blocked on every side and in summertime I get the echo. Coming to the um, cross ventilation that I mentioned before, I'm not aware, it does say in the um, DA that there will be at least 60% of units are naturally cross ventilated. Do we know whether the wet areas, which are the ones that really do need the cross ventilation, are those being uh, done with ventilation or are they being done with open windows? Because it does say that each room will have a window. Um, I'd be impressed if there was a window in the kitchen, but I, I could be wrong. There is one little extra that bothers me, and that is that the, uh, the DA identifies that residents would have access to a council reserve. I am a little bit perplexed because there ain't no council reserve when you walk around that area. There is a nature strip right next door to the railway line and there is a um, exit for cars that are coming from underneath the bridge. Are we actually using a new form of terminology to call a nature strip a council reserve? That is also said with a little bit of humour because it happens. And lastly, the echo between the buildings. Uh, there is something there that the, none of this DA is going to address, neither will the DA for the next building that could go up on the other corner. It, it is something that affects summertime life in units, but it's not something that is being considered, recognised, the best that we have is that plan of management which says no amplified music on the uh, rooftop. That's, that's not even believable. That just about covers all my points. All right. Thank you. Just remain seated and I'll see if there are any questions from the panel. panel? No. No, thank you. No. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Our next submitter is Mr Kevin Coleman. Please come forward. Yes, it's <clears throat> quite all right. I'm Kevin Coleman. This is Luca Laos. We're joint owners of Nine Bounds Road. Sorry, how do you spell your name, Luke? Uh, Luca L U K A. Yep. Surname is Laos. L A U S. L A U S. U S L A U S. Yes. All right. Thank you for the record. Um, I'm not very well prepared, as you probably would know. Uh, I wasn't planning to be here till uh, you kindly paid us a visit. You're on this the, afternoon. Um, the heritage listed house in the corner, aren't you? Yeah, that was another thing. I wasn't sure if uh, it's kind of known that we live in a heritage house and the house next door is also heritage. Good, thank you. Um, just a brief overview of that. We bought it in 88, did a lot of work on it, council then Heritage listed it in um, 1999 and that's had a devastating effect on the value of it. Uh, I would say 25% of its true value were it to be sold to a developer. Going on 
properties that are being sold now along railway parade past the school at 10,000 per square metre. Uh, so the points I've put and made note of are overshadowing, yep. which is in one of your diagrams. Um, <coughs> Thanks for that. What, what's the drawing it's, number? Uh, <coughs> do I go by this number here? DA 60 one dash four. And 21st of June, 3 p.m., uh, the little grey area there is at the Raj, and you having been there would realise that at 3 p.m. we're well and truly in the shade. I would estimate we're in the shade. The back area that you saw is in the shade around 1.30, 1.45. Mm -hmm. Prior to the building being built last year on Railway Parade, we used to get sunlight at that time of the year till 4.30. So that's a pretty major change. Um, on level four and five diagrams, if you can bear with me. Okay. The, okay, so take us to that, that would be... Um, okay, the first one is, do uh, you know the full bit or just 030007-4? Dash four, yeah. <laughs> The, the building steps in at that level. Is that, a, is that a balcony or is it just a roof line off the floors below on the left? This uh, Which, uh, roof area is. would be a roof yeah. below. Okay, okay. Yeah. So then on the same drawing, that shows what looks to be a much larger window than is on 030-008-4. It has a kind of strange window which looks like it has a panel in the centre. I didn't understand that. And they're the two windows that mostly um, affect our privacy, those two levels. The others don't because they have highlights which um, are from the kitchen and from the bathroom. And I think the terrace, it's not very clear whether it has angled louvers on that side or it actually is a solid wall. But uh, on the concept drawing, I think it looks like angled louvers, but I can't be sure. Right. The next, uh, sorry. Just a question, would a dilapidation report be done on our garage? We were told in, 90, uh, 2001 and uh, mid-2015, yep. whatever. Okay, okay but garbage, I think that's okay. Heritage, I covered that. Um, and I think the front fence doesn't look very attractive, but it was more, more so in the previous drawings. I, as I said to you, I don't know why the drawings we got were totally different because they were off the council site. But right, that was so probably a previous uh, concept. The front fence drawing we're looking at is uh, 040-001 underscore 4. 0 dash, sorry. Sorry, 040-001 underscore 4. That's the uh, northeast yep. elevation. Yeah, yeah. It looks a bit prison-like, that's all, but I mean, it's not a major point for us, but right. it just seems a pretty excessive Okay, so for I a... understand your submission, Mr Coleman, it's about two major issues for you, which is overshadowing yep. and the privacy impacts. Yep, and also uh, on behalf of the fellow who lives in number three, Bellevue, he is more impacted than we are, but right. he's not able to be here anyway, so... Okay. He's very right. Angry. Is that the um, is that your submission? Yep. I did a written submission. I don't know what part that plays. Well, it's taken on board during the assessment process. Okay, because that was kind of those points anyway. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'll just see if there's any questions of the panelists. No. Yeah. I just got one. Did, did you have something in mind in in terms of the fence? Uh, so I just sort of looked a very. Uh, 
It looks a bit like the one that's already on the corner there, that um, commercial property. It's a kind of um, vertical rod uh, fence of about two metres, maybe. That looks similar, but uh, no, it's, it's, it affects more than more more uh, more of the so the people that live in it than us. So I guess it's done for security, but uh, we don't have a fence like that, as you might have noticed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yep. Correct. All right. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank and you, um, a decision will be taken uh, later today and published on the council's website. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That concludes that matter. All right. Yeah. Um, moving to the next. Oh, sorry. I think the architect. I'm sorry. The you are the architect. Um, sorry, I thought that's really right. Okay. Well, hence I don't have your name on the running sheet. Um, would you like to make a submission? Well, if you need to make a submission, you need to come forward, sir. And you need to give us your name for the for the purposes of the uh, the minutes. Sorry, I apologise for that. Sorry, your name is? It's Jim Apostolou. A P O. A P O. S T O. S T O. L O U. L O U. All right. And you're an architect. Architect, yes. I'm the registered architect. All right. Um, Look, and you obviously you prepared these plans, yes? Correct, yes. Right, yes. Thank you. Uh, look, we're, we're, we're happy with the recommendation, and just as, as a background, um, you know, we had the DRP meeting, and, and then from that we, we had several comments from, from council. So I, I think the process has been good in terms of, um, uh, you know, some of the main changes were to, to get better circulation from, from the entry point of the building to the lift core. And then out to the accumulated space, uh, and then the other two main things was to improve solar access and cross ventilation to the apartments, uh, which yeah has generally improved the amenity uh, of of the apartments and the, and the future occupants. Um, in terms of the the objections made uh, with with the first uh, lady that spoke, there was there was some concern about cross ventilation yeah. in terms of. Uh, the units and kitchens and bathrooms. Uh, the ADG is about, as you're aware, it's, it's about cross ventilation to the apartment and not not typically to to the bathrooms or, or, or to the kitchen. Um, our depth of units comply um, from living to the back of kitchen wall, so um, we don't see any any concerns there. Uh, there may have been some typos in the uh, statement of environmental effects. Uh, Terms of distances, we're about 600 metres to, to Carlton Station, so, um, but I don't think that really has no, any right. major play. It doesn't have any major role to play. Yeah. I mean, we understand yeah. that the distances between. Yeah, we're still between Carlton and Codra and Station. And the, and the yeah. Various yeah. Well, if it was Herschel Station, it was actually a, a cut and paste uh, error. Uh, and, and then, in terms of the second objective, in terms of uh, privacy, I just had a look at. Uh, the southeast elevation, and we have some high-level windows to just so take a to the plan number you're referring to. Okay. So we're on. Uh, it's drawing for uh, ARDA forty double oh three. Underscore so, four. Yeah. Yep. Underscore four, which is yep. the southeast elevation. Correct. Uh, in terms of ADG setbacks, we strictly comply with the six metres and, and the nine metres to the upper floors. Uh, so, strictly speaking, we can have windows uh, yeah. on that facade. But uh, where is it directly adjacent to that heritage property? We do have secondary high-level windows to a bedroom, and and uh, the the other window adjacent is a bathroom. So, if there are any concerns about that, uh, we, we could add. Privacy screens, oh, but they're high-level windows anyway, so it, there really is no overlooking from from that property there. Um, in terms of the the balcony to uh, to the middle apartment there. So what? Hang on. The, the it's uh, ARD thirteen double <coughs> six. Yeah. Correct. That has a a, a nine metre setback. Um, all the way from ground floor to to the to the fifth floor, mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't even go to the six meters on the lower four floors. Uh, so it strictly complies with with the ADG in terms of uh, building separation there. But if there are any concerns, there, it's a south facing unit, so we don't particularly want to put privacy louvers on that. But if if that's something that helps 
uh, that neighbour. Maybe we can do some sliding screens, uh, potentially, if, if, if that could, assists. Could you maybe even consider some solid balustrade. We we were on site today yeah. at the neighbours, and it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I think that could be a good solution yeah. as well. Yeah, and. Um, just on those upper level windows, would it worry you to have highlight windows in those bedrooms? Just turn to just sheet double O three four, sheet forty on the elevations here. I'll probably show you here. Uh, that, that's to a bedroom there, so perhaps rather than just a high level window, could we potentially look at privacy screens? Is there yeah, any room you've room? got no bathroom windows? Is that just something missed on plan, or is that you're not intending to have bathroom windows? Um, yes, it's just been missed on plan. So if 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 the panel wanted to condition to add windows in, uh, we're, we're happy to take that as, as a condition. Windows. Yeah, but yeah. your preference is privacy screens on those on those upper two uh, units. Yeah, to the to the bedrooms. Okay, uh, but we're generally happy with. With 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 the way the process has, has come through, I'm obviously happy with the recommendation for approval. That's good. That yes. you're happy with We're the happy process. With yes. <laughs> Some people aren't. Yes. Yes. No. They, they, Mark and, and Co have been good to deal with. All right. Yeah. Good. It's good to hear. All right. Any further questions, panelists? No. All right. Thank you, okay. Mr. Possible. Thanks. Lou, um, decision will be taken um, later today and published on the council's website. That concludes that matter. <clears throat> now move to the next item, which is. Um, 6 to 8 Vaughan Street, Blakehurst. We don't have anyone speaking against the proposal. We do have Mr. Ben Black, Town Planner, Mario Murad and Ali McKeron um, on behalf of the applicant. Um, perhaps if all three of you come forward, it might be more convenient. Ali from Greenview couldn't make it, so I've got Andy. Okay, so we've got a replacement. Yes, from the engineers, Greenview. So it's, uh, who is it? Andy. Andy. Does Andy have a surname? I do. All right, thank you. Please proceed. We're happy to make a recommendation for approval. Um, there are um, some conditions there deferred commencement, which we prefer not to have, but um, upon review, it's something that we couldn't challenge at this point, um, requiring either an easement or absorption trench, and absorption trench is the one we'll most likely go for, but we need geotechnical information to support that. So we don't have it at this point, um, but we're happy with the consent otherwise, and here to uh, answer any questions that come on that. Um, I don't think I have any questions about this one. Okay, panels, any questions? No questions. Any questions? Any? No. Mr. Jones. All right, anything further you wish to put to the panel? All That's right, fine. okay, well, um, thank you for your attendance. The decision will be taken later on today and published on the Council's website. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. That brings us to the last item on the agenda, which is uh, the DA for boundary adjustment at 105 Victoria Avenue and 2A Cook Street, Mortdale. We do not have any registered speakers, so a decision will be taken uh, later today and published on the council's website. And that now, ladies and gentlemen, concludes the George's River Local Planning Panel meeting for the 15th of August 2019. And I thank you all for your attendance. It is now. 5.41, meeting closed.